It is my pleasure to introduce painter Donna Nelson, who is widely regarded as one of the most relentlessly searching, rigorously idiosyncratic, and technically inventive American painters today. Nelson's use of color and variety of effects is engrossing. If you have seen her work in the Simpatico show at the BU Art Gallery next door, you will know what I mean. There is physicality to Nelson's paintings, working sometimes on both sides of the canvas, which when combined with what has been described as her loopy abstraction, brings, brings tremendous vitality to painting today. At the risk of stepping on a few toes, I must say that I am among those who believe the greatest painters working today, at least in the United States, are women. To quote Donna Nelson, who she believes, the important thing in painting isn't how much time it takes to make the painting, but the painting's quality of time. Both scale and timing are fugitive aspects of abstract painting that can't be taught or even talked about. When Donna was in the second grade, her mother took an art class. She loved her mother's little wooden art box with rows of heavy tubes of oil paint. She would take the tubes out of the box, take the caps off, and smell the paint. She says from then on, she was a painter and has been painting seriously ever since. Among many awards, Donna Nelson has received a John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Fellowship, two NEA painting grants, and a Tsuki Foundation grant. She is in the collection of the Guggenheim and Metropolitan Museums in New York, and the MIT collection, and many corporate collections, including Chase Manhattan Bank and Microsoft. Currently, Donna Nelson is a professor at Tyler School of the Arts in Philadelphia. Please join me in welcoming Donna Nelson. Okay. <laughs> well, it, this isn't, I don't have two mics, do I? I, I, uh, I generally don't go back as far as I'm going to go back tonight. But I think, uh, I generally don't try to tell people about my circuitous route of being an artist because it's so circuitous. And <laughs> but tonight I'm going to do that. And so um, <clears throat> I'll tell you that uh, I went to the Whitney program in New York when I was 19 as an undergraduate. It was the first or second year of the program. And uh, I went from Columbus, Ohio, where I had studied as an undergraduate for a year or a year and a half with the painter Malcolm Morley. And um, he was a very important influence on me in that he taught me that all painting is conceptual and that distinctions between abstraction and representation were uh, <clears throat> not really what painting was. <laughs> so I, when I was an uh, undergraduate, we did, it was, Ohio State was a big pop school. Uh, Lichtenstein had graduated th from there a couple years before. And um, all my early paintings in, as an undergraduate were abstract and pop. I started out, uh, the thing of it is when you're young, history, is, you encounter history all at one time. So I really knew very, actually very little about painting. Um, I had gone to the Columbus Museum of Fine Art as a teenager. I fell in love with Marston Hartley and O'Keeffe, and they had a very good collection there of that, those early American modernists. Uh, but as far as contemporary art, I knew very little. And uh, so I started out uh, actually being influenced by Motherwell and Lichtenstein, kind of equally. And so I would do these throw and ink drawings and grid them up and then um, transfer them grid by grid just with black ink on a white gessoed canvas so they're very flat. And uh, that's what I did as an undergraduate. So uh, when I went to the Whitney program, I was very young, I, I, I was very uh, intellectually, uh, very underdeveloped, <laughs> and um, the big impact on me while I was in the Whitney program was that we went to a lot of artist studios. We went to Frank Stella's studio, we went to Bryce Martin's studio, we heard uh, Barnett Newman talk, 
And th the biggest impact on me were two things. One was the space of the city of New York, uh, being surrounded with these very tall buildings, being channeled down these streets. I spent all my time out walking in the city. And the second thing was the way artists arranged their studios. The piles of material where the tables were. I remember Stella's studio very well. I remember the paintings he was working on when we visited. And it's the way artists go about working really interests me. And it even interests me as a teacher. I'm very interested in student studios, in, in just the way, they, the way it's arranged and what the arrangement uh, allows you to do and even affects your thinking. Because the distinction between physical arrangements and space and uh, intellectual investigation is a false distinction. So I'm going to start here. A few years after I graduated from the Whitney program, I went to David Smith's um, place on Bolton Landing in New York. It was shortly after he had died. I was with a friend who was writing something on David Smith. And uh, I was, uh, this is the way it looked. This is the way it looked on the day I went. In 19, I think it was 1969, 1970. Um, all of these Smith sculptures were marching up the hill like an army. And uh, Smith had built uh, these small cinder, cinder block buildings on his property. And one on the, below the hill was the welding studio. He had built a little house for himself in which he had huge furniture that he had gotten at some Scottish castle. And so the furniture, I was very struck, the scale of the house and the scale of the furniture was very different. And then he had a big drawing studio. And I think Ken Nolan said, David Smith really knew how to go about working. And it was clear that uh, for something as heavy as steel and welting, that he uh, used these materials with the fluidity that uh, Stella used, felt, and so on. So I was very impressed with this. And this is a photograph of Smith, a late photograph of him looking over his sculptures. OK, this is a little uh, poured painting. Like I said, when I was an undergraduate, I did kind of pop work and gridded these up and did these pours uh, you know, um, large. But by the time I got to New York, about 1970, I started doing them directly. I started going back in history toward the abstract expressionists. And I did these enamel paintings, direct pours. This is called House at Night. And about the same time, uh, within a year or so later, I started doing these large oil paintings that were um, very uh, inspired by the uh, space of the city of New York. And this is called Loon, inspired by the lights at night. And this is the early 70s. I had a show I started showing way too young. <laughs> and um, I had a show in 1975, my first one-person show. And these are paintings, actually, that I made right after the show, which I have found throughout my life is kind of the way it is. I'll have a show, and then I'll make, make the, the kind of the better work after the show. So anyway, these are big paintings. and. Uh, I was very concerned with the density of the color, and I'd spread the paint out on cardboard so it soaks up the oil. So uh, the, the, I like these very dense uh, yellows. And uh, you know, I was inspired by the architecture of the city of New York and also where I come from, which is the plains, and driving down the highways and seeing the water towers and so on. <clears throat> I was interested in twisting the space, trying to get space, the feeling of space into the painting. Uh, these contradictions, like the shadows becoming the architecture, and so on. And these paintings are about nine foot by seven foot. Uh, I was very, uh, in, I was very influenced by Myron Stout at this time, and uh, and his surfaces and. 
This is one of the last. Of, I made a big series of these paintings. This is one of the last ones I made in 1976. It's about 70 by 40. And I was also looking at early Italian Renaissance paintings, is that and the twist, the twists in space, trying to do a flat painting where you get a twist in the space. Anyway, I had kind of a, I don't know if you'd call it an epiphany, but I had a, an experience that had a big effect on me. I went up to Yale University Art Gallery, and uh, that was like in 1978, 1979. I saw this painting by Manet, uh, and I was said to myself, why am I painting flat? <laughs> why am I trying so hard to get space into a painting in such a, um, I don't know, it seemed like such a tortured way? And it didn't make any sense to me. Um, I thought what was interesting in painting was illusion, uh, but it was the specific illusion of a painting rather than, you know, represent, uh, representational modeling and that kind of thing. Anyway, this painting had a, had a big effect on me. It stopped me in my tracks. And so I started to try to make my paintings more painterly. So this is a painting about uh, 50 by 80. And it's the last painting I made. I, I've been painting since I was 12. And this is the last painting I made before I decided to quit painting. And that was in 1980, 1979. And uh, I just, it occurred to me what it was to be a woman in relation to the tradition of painting. And suddenly, it seemed ridiculous to me, absurd. <laughs> the whole tradition of painting had been made by men. You know, this had never occurred to me. And even though it was the height of the feminist movement, I was kind of off, off in my own world. I was very appalled. <laughs> um, I, I knew uh, Lucy Lepard a little bit and, and uh, women in the feminist movement, but I was very appalled by, you know, the idea of, of uh, Lucy's first book was like painting from the center or something like that. And, and I considered myself a sophisticated painter. I was very, uh, you know, insulted if somebody would bring up George O'Keefe because I was thinking about Barnett Newman. So uh, I was a snob <laughs> and sexist and also, and that's very odd, double-edged sword for a woman. It's a double-edged sword that you're constantly using a history that's been created by men. And there's no way around it. And this just suddenly became clear to me and I thought this is ridiculous. So I quit painting. And I started, I, on, I embarked on another career. And, but after about a year and a half, I missed my studio so much. It was so cold and so dark. And I felt like a very big part of my identity was simply missing. So, I started back with the first paintings I had done when I was 11. This is a painting of my mother. This is, this is a painting I made in 1981. It's a painting of my father. I had never done figurative painting. I had never painted from the model. I'd never done any of that traditional stuff that you do in art school. So my paintings were very kind of stiff and primitive. And my father was a, uh, a surveyor in, in Nebraska. So this is called Portrait of Myself as a Man. It was my way to give myself power, and um, power in relation to the history of painting. It was kind of like a golem figure. It was made in 1982. And uh, it's a big painting. I like big paintings, that's my main thing. Okay, I tried to get models into my studio, because uh, I didn't know how to paint from the figure. And this woman, her name was Doretta, and I painted it down in Virginia, where I was teaching at the time. And uh, I, I knew in my mind exactly the outfit I wanted this woman to wear. So I put a little description of the, of the woman I wanted to pose for me. I put it around campus, and this woman knocked on my door. Her name was Doretta. And she sat for me, and I started 
at the uh, stool and the, and the shoes and moved up and moved up. It was all going fine. Moved up, moved up. When I got to her face, I couldn't paint it. I, I worked and worked. I kept scraping it down. And she, kept, and she was beautiful. And she kept wanting to see the painting. And I'm like, you know, I really don't know how to do figure painting. And this is just experimental. And so I gave her excuse after excuse. And I kept scraping off the face and putting it back on. It came out in this weird mask way. And at the time, I, I was actually looking at a lot of Picasso Rose Period paintings. And they had gotten, it wasn't conscious, but it had gotten into my, you know, pre-conscious, I think. But in any case, finally, she insisted on seeing the painting. And she left my studio, and she never came back. <laughs> so. I had to just end the painting at this point. But I do think that it, it does reflect something about the way women are depicted and have been depicted in the kind of violence of being turned into a mask and so on. Um, but wasn't conscious, because none of my stuff is usually conscious at the time. And then I look back and think, oh my heavens. So um, I painted. You know, I love New York, and I might as well have been in the 1930s, and this is the 1980s, and everybody else is doing, you know, I don't know, like David Sally, deconstructed pop kind of stuff, and I'm like painting the Brooklyn Bridge. I love the Brooklyn Bridge. And this was the 100th anniversary of the Brooklyn Bridge, 1983, and uh, it's all the people. To me, it was like uh, high art for the masses. It was a great celebration with fire coming down off the bridge, a waterfall of fire, and all of this uh, fireworks in the air. And I did several big paintings of this event. And these are all the people walking across, in my imagination, walking across the river and the cathedral of, that the Brooklyn Bridge is. I painted uh, Prospect Park. I would go out there on my bicycle. And these are all large paintings. I tried to say something in my painting. I tried to express something about time, about going to the park over a period of a few weeks at the end of February, where the, the weather and the season was changing. Um, I happened to see around this time this little Duchamp drawing in the Guggenheim, which interested me very much because, uh, because of the very open nature of the organization of the space. And the idea that the space could shift and move around, because I feel that the problem with painting in my time has been that the spa space tends to get locked. It tends to get locked into familiar compositions. And so this is still, to me, a very, very beautiful work from 19, I think, 11. It's called Study for a Chess Game. So I was painting a baby park. I did a few, a whole series of these paintings. 82 80, uh, by 82. There was a, a little park near where I lived. And, but somehow my own childhood, I was kind of dealing actually with my own childhood all through the 80s. So this is kind of like 19, uh, you know, Bobsy Twins type illustration. But it just kind of came naturally out of the drawing. And these are just gesso and charcoal. I also did um, these interiors, and uh, I was just struck with these headlines, you know, uh, the sports page next to the headline, nuclear arms build up. <laughs> so I did like a whole series of these table paintings. And this one's kind of flat, and the, the windows are kind of cut into the table. I was in it like a real disarray, a personality kind of disarray at this time. So it's kind of reflected in my paintings. This is a painting I did when I was like 13. The reason I show it to you is it inspired, it's called Joe's Bar. I always like bars. It inspired this painting, which I did in 1987. And I did this out in California. And this is an important painting for me because it's the first painting in which I used muslin. And uh, I built the figure. I, I, was, I was using thicker and thicker paint, and I was spending a fortune on paint. And I wanted real bulky 
you know, a real bulky surface. So I started gluing on muslin and building up these figures and, uh, you know, working more physically. This is called California Landscape or the Man Who Needs Everything. And these are just like, and then my paint started to change really, really fast. As soon as I started using all those materials, the, you know, the paintings just changed fast. <laughs> and I started dyeing, um, you know, pieces of strips of canvas and uh, pouring paint. And it's called full sack. And then I was dying, this is 1990, I did this series of octopus paintings because somebody came to my studio and they said, well, Donna, you, you have all these different kinds of paintings. You're kind of like, they mentioned like the octopus vase in Janssen. It's probably still there, Jan, you know, big Janssen art book. And they said, you're kind of like Minoan, a Minoan artist, you know, like, um, and that was a matriarchal cu culture. Now, they said that to me. I still don't, haven't really investigated to see if that's the truth. But anyway, that statement had a big impact on me. Sometimes things people say to me really impact me a lot. So <clears throat> I made a whole series of these octopus paintings based on this crazy little vase with this kind of cartoony octopus from like very long ago. An octopus is like a hand. He says, this is dyed uh, canvas strips. This is from 1990. It's a stuffed painting, and it's, it's about the beach. I was going to the beach all the time on the subway and laying on the sand and listening to the water. I, of course, switched to acrylic. It was a very good period for me creatively. This is called history. These are kind of door-sized paintings, a little bigger islands. They're very, very built up. I was interested in the idea, and I still am, a lot of my ideas I haven't really completed. I probably never will. But I'm very interested in the idea of when a shape uh, starts to read as an image, and when just a blob of material starts to read as an image. This painting kind of deals with that. These crows are painted with oil paint. And then just like, you know, I just like stream of conscious kind of paintings. This is a little technique that I kind of made up, which is cheesecloth. At that time, cheesecloth was really cheap, but now it's kind of gotten expensive. But um, cheesecloth with gel medium, you can work with it, and it's kind of just like clay, and it will uh, it will dry like clay. This is called Blue Sea, Green Sea. It's a big painting. I was working against the physicality with the silver wash. I was thinking actually about coming into LA on a plane and you know, coming through the smog. It's got canvas strips, uh, muslin, and probably cheesecloth in there. Okay, this is an abrupt shift, like I tend to do. I, it actually was in response to the fact that I was supposed to have a show someplace, and the curator was like, well, what are you going to show? And I'm like, well, I'll show this one, I'll show this one, I'll show this one, because that's what I do. And she's like, well, it's, not gonna, it's going to be very incoherent. <coughs> so I tried to make a coherent body of work. And also, this was the, called the Stations of the Subway. And they were all paintings the same size. And they were kind of revisiting the paintings I had made, the hard edge paintings I had made in the 70s, which I had destroyed. And so uh, I was thinking back on my years of living in New York. And I firmly believe that the city of New York has created a lot of the paintings made in New York City. <laughs> of course, of course it has. People go out in the streets and they're. <laughs> so anyway. This is uh, a Con Ed steam, and that's probably me. This is the first one, and then I just, I did these paintings very fast. I was trying to actually do a series, and uh, I won't show you all of them, but there's a 12, there's actually 13 paintings. Uh, this is Express Local, thinking about the subway, 
thinking, again, it, you can see it revisits my hard edge paintings from the 70s, but with pores of enamel and so on. This is taken right from that first, uh, that first little painting I showed you, fleshy reflection. The idea of a building, you know, changing its shape in a puddle of water. This is called wheels. I was thinking about the subways at night, the noise, which I love. I don't live in New York. And I was such a New Yorker for my whole life, and now I live in a very weird place. I was telling Lynn, it's like I dropped from Mars and I landed where I live. Um, <laughs> I start at, at, the, at that time, I also started to do go back to my, because I love this way of working. I really love it. And so I went back to the cheesecloth and so on, and I was doing this kind of painting at the same time as I was doing that series of kind of, of those enamel paintings. This is called the tuning fork, trying to get myself back in gear, do my own work and not worry about what the curator thinks. Always a good idea. Okay, this is the second show. I, I, that, that uh, Stations of the Subway, I ended up showing at Chiman Reed and in New York. And this is the second show I had there, which was a much more freewheeling show. And I made these big constructions that were completely ugly. I suppose that's what everybody said, they're very ugly. But, I mean, I really am not opposed to ugly art at all. I don't even think that way. But. Um, this is a, a big const uh, abstract construction, and then what I would do is stretch canvas over it and do a rubbing of it. And what I found is I could do three or four of these rubbings, which I did with big blocks of graphite, and they would be, suggest imagery of different sorts, even doing three or four rubbings from the same abstract surface. So this rubbing, comes from that construction. And this is an installation shot of that show called Tactile Image. And this, this is a big abstract construction, and these rubbings come from that construction. This was very fun body of work. And that's just a singular picture of one of the rubbings, because I love not being able to predict what my imagery is going to be. And I do feel I get a lot from just being in the studio and just working, and, and that's, my, that's where my energy comes from, it actually comes from the paintings themselves. Okay, anyway, so this is another painting, just a very rudimentary painting big. These are recent works. I tried to do the rubbings with oil paint and I couldn't do it. It just all smeared up and it didn't work at all. So I wanted color in my work. And so I started uh, thinking about the idea of a two-sided painting, which is like a rubbing. In, in other words, I was putting uh, the idea of putting the construction and the rubbing together into one painting. <coughs> the back of this. This is called the 4th and the 5th of July. Those are, those are some, insta or some uh, details. Oh, I don't have the back of it? Huh, forgot. Well, I'm sorry. Well, um, anyway, so it goes, this is uh, an installation shot of this painting. It's pretty, it's out in Brooklyn at a, a little gallery called Regina Rex. And I really like this installation shot because I think that the, the I like the way the people look with the painting. And that's the way I install that. Now, I use racks like I have over it. The gallery here, I have now these steel racks so I can put the painting out or I use these cheese, uh, these milk crates, which I make the painting on the milk crates. So it makes kind of conceptual sense to do that. And that's the back. This, this painting is actually kind of an important painting to me. I'm still working. I like the way, um, 
That's in, in the side, well, now I'm going all directions. Yeah, this is a cheesecloth that I just threw on the back here. And um, I very much uh, am, well, am interested, actually, in the kind of imagery, the kind of abstract imagery I got from doing that. So that's a very natural one. I don't, as I work, well, the way I work is I, I uh, you know, work one side and put the cheesecloth and so on on, and then I'll pour paint, and then I'll take the canvas off and turn it around, and I do that, you know, a few times until I'm sure which is the front and which is the back. It, it's not an arbitrary thing. It's always very clear to me which is the front and which is the back. And, uh, of course, I've lived in Philadelphia for a number of years now, amazing number of years. And uh, this is uh, the large glass, and this is in the Duchamp room at the uh, Philadelphia Museum. And I, I'm sure that this has gotten into me, into my mind. It's not very direct, but things get into me all the time. This is at the University of Pennsylvania Archaeology Museum, which I love. And uh, a friend of mine took this photograph. I just thought it was so beautiful. And just the, the idea of the, oh, sorry, clicking around here. Just the idea of the a rudimentary shape and so on that suggests, you know, an image. But the image is just kind of there in the stone without being detailed and turned into a fixed thing. It's still mobile still alive, and that's like nature, and that really interests me in these ruins. This is a recent painting. That's the back. That's the front. That's called hair conditioning. It's a very bleached out image of a recent painting on its stand, because I like these stands now, because I can put them around People, you know, I, I don't mind that the painting, I don't mind the kind of dorkiness. I'm sure it's not good for me, you know, in terms of showing, but I don't mind the kind of dorkiness of the stand, the steel stand, and then the painting with the wood and the canvas. I don't mind that. Uh, I want to present the painting. This is a painting. This is a stand. And it's just purely a functional thing. I did design this and had a friend of mine make it. But uh, it's just a purely functional thing. That's another recent painting. Sometimes I leave the stretchers on if I like the color that the wood has turned out. I don't mind. This is like some old stretcher of mine from a stretcher builder that's been closed 30 years. I have a quite a nice bunch of stretchers that I keep using and reusing. This is a, a place I like in, in Philadelphia. It's a very strange place, actually, because these are um, little decorative temple elements from Java in Indonesia from the 11th and 12th century. And the Fairmont Park Association came along and put them here in this, de in this derelict fountain. It's got this ugly 70s derelict fountain. And I suppose originally that the water came from the spouts, but now there they sit. And I love these forms because, you know, at the University of Pennsylvania Archaeology Museum, I can't touch the sculptures, and I can touch these forms. And they are really beautiful, and they're stuck there in that in that fountain. This is, this is the uh, nameplate, five spouts, frog and lentil. Java, Indonesia, 11th and 12th century. I, I brought the paper with me, but I left it in my hotel room, so I can't read, read to you about them. But they're, uh, they're about actually, uh, yeah, they're temple ornaments, and they have something to do with reincarnation. And they're very beautiful. A 
And so these are a couple of my last paintings. Uh, this is called House and Travels. I have a, there's a, it's got a back to it, but I don't have it. But this is one of my last paintings. That's it. Any questions? Yeah, there is a question. Yes. Hi. Oh, sorry. Um, you said you were teaching while you started doing the figure paintings. How do you think that affected how you taught your students? Oh, that's an interesting question. Well, I was a visiting artist, doing a visiting artist gig. And uh, I actually don't think that it, I, you know, I can't, I, I don't really think it, uh, it affected the way I was teaching. I, I don't actually mix, I hope I don't mix my own work up with students. I'm really interested in art. I'm really interested in what students do. I like the rudimentary uh, nature of what students do. I think it's a lot of times a lot more interesting art-wise than a very official art. So, um, oh, that was very easy. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's not much of an answer, but I don't think it was a long time ago, too, so I don't actually remember. <laughs> oh, wait. Hi. Um, can you talk about the, how you balance like the element of chance with the spill and what you think the painting will look like or what maybe your plan is before you do that process? Yeah, that's a very good question. I really let the spill rule. I really do. I don't, the main thing is with me is to work with good concentration. I don't listen to music. I, I don't have a telephone in my studio and um, to be very, very connected to my materials, so I'm really watching what's going on. And, um, and the, so I'm really, uh, I don't try to control, I, in the stations of the subway, uh, I, they're much more controlled, the spill, but in the paintings I do now, um, the way I, what I do is I work flat on um, these uh, milk crates and I tilt the painting you know, so the stain will go this way and that way. But on the paintings I'm working now, I don't really have an idea of how the painting is gonna come out. Um, you know, I kinda let it do its own thing. And I used to actually destroy a lot of paintings that I decided I didn't like the way they look, but now it's kind of an element of, oh, integrity, is that I destroy very few paintings anymore. I let the painting be what it is, without being judgmental of it. You know, because I feel like there's so much judgment in art that's not very useful or interesting, actually. It's kind of like those, those uh, elements I showed uh, at the fountain. You know, the way the nature, the way the uh, weather has worn them away is, is just the way they are. And I kind of would, would like uh, I'm sure that I, I, I interfere more than I would like, but I would kind of like my paintings to be that way. And I work outside a lot, actually, particularly in the summer, because I like the light all around me. And, you know, I work with a lot of water. And uh, it's mainly the working process. I'm not even kind of worried about the painting anymore. I don't. I'm not. Thank you, thank you so much for your um, talk, and it was really exciting to learn more about your work. I also had a question relating to process. I was wondering, in particular with the two-sided paintings, how you begin to work. Do you work on unstretched canvas at all? No, no. Or I have a, I have a, I have a whole bunch of stretchers from years, <laughs> and um, I stretch up the canvas on a regular stretcher. And then I'll start it off with like generally uh, uh, throwing a lot of cheesecloth cheese and stuff on there. 
and I'll let it dry, you know, and then I'll come out and I'll mix up a lot of colors I like, and, um, you know, I'll start throwing the colors on there. Oh, well, the one thing, you have to brush the canvas with uh, flow, uh, flow release, which is a golden product, which allows the canvas to take the stain. And so, and then it will drip through to the back. And then usually I'll take the can when it dries, I'll take the canvas off, I'll turn it around, and I'll start working on the back or on the front again, which is smooth, you know. And uh, a lot of times I'll start the canvas by uh, just imprinting the stretcher marks, you know, with a spatula and uh, watery acrylic. And that provides a structure for all of this. So. It was an accident. I was working outside and I was working like crazy on a painting and scrubbing with, it was green and I was scrubbing with sand and all and hosing it down. And uh, I turned it around and it was beautiful glowing orange painting with the stretcher marks there. And I'm like, whoa. I knew right away I'd really found something because I do feel the two-sided paintings are my work actually, after all these years, I feel it's, this is something I can really work with and something I can sustain and something that has metaphorical implications to me and I can really, it's something I can really develop, you know? Yeah. Um, do dreams influence your paintings or is it uh, mostly the waking life? Totally waking life. Although, I have to say that I have important dreams. Every once in a while, about every, I just had one, an important dream. And every, and these dreams, they help me. <laughs> and somebody else back there? Okay. Hi, Donna. Um, this, is, this is my friend Rochelle, who's I, here at the Radcliffe yeah. Institute. <laughs> uh, I guess I have more of an observation. I know you work quite well, and I'm a great admirer. Uh, and the observation in watching the presentation is you showed the works, well, the whole presentation um, kind of generated a number of thoughts, but the one that I'm thinking about now that I'm going to cast on to is is something about the work, how it, how it generates itself, how it's generative in and of itself. And yeah. particularly, uh, the examples were the pieces that you had to chime and read. We discussed them as doing you know, the rubbings of the painting, so that there were three uh, iterations, in a sense, and, and the, the original, so-called, the painting right. itself, um, as the matrix, was not any more dominant than any of the, uh, than the other two that came from it. Right. And then to go to these more recent paintings of the, the two-sided, the versos, um, and how those, again, it's like the painting is generating itself. Yeah, yeah. And I, that's just an observation. It should have hit me earlier, that's but it just did, and I just, if you want to talk about that, great. Yeah, if you don't, I'm really I just wanted to share it. Share it. Really yeah. interested in that. Because I don't, and I feel like, uh, I want the painting to keep generating, and my goal is that a painting keeps generating itself after it's done and when it's displayed, that it keeps producing itself somehow, like those little stone things do for me. And um, I think if you don't, or don't have things nailed down too tightly about wh what the work is in relation to art history or especially what it means, because what my paintings mean, I really don't know at the time. And I have made some mistakes in the past by trying to say what I thought they meant. And it's only after many years that I kind of understand them, you know? So a painting, I really am interested in the self-generating kind of painting. And I, I am, of course, very interested in Jackson Pollock, and um, particularly bad Pollock, late Pollock. 
so-called bad Pollock. There's no bad Pollock. Pollock is fantastic. But late Pollock, to me, really, they're generating themselves because he's so lost. It's in the state of being lost. That is, that's, when, that's when the art starts generating itself. You know, so I don't mind, you know, I actually don't mind the ups and downs of being an artist anymore because it's the worst times. It's the st times when you're most lost. That's when the art then can really take over and really make itself. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm really interested in the sculptural nature of your works, the real tactile quality of the things that you apply to the canvas, and then especially in your two-sided ones, how they take on this kind of cross between sculpture and painting. So, um, and after hearing your talk, the, the interest you have in those little stone forms and the touch of the ones that you saw in Philadelphia, um, I'm, I'm interested in your take on the difference between the sculpt, sculpture and painting, your, your view of the difference between sculpture and painting, and if you're compelled to do, it seems like your work gets more and more sculptural right now as it's developing, I, I, if you're well, compelled I, I towards think, that. Well, you know, as usual, it's about 90% of my work I haven't solved yet, but I, I don't actually think of it as sculptural. I think of it as screens. Screens, I like that idea. And uh, you know, I like the idea of one of my paintings kind of in the middle of a room or something as a screen, so you can't see the other side and you have to walk around it. It's like a figure, it's like a figure. It's, oh, and uh, is a figure sculptural? Well, not exactly, but that's what it's like. It's like being, me being able to take my abstract paintings and give them a figurative presence. But I don't think of them as sculpture, really. But David Smith, you know, did a lot of uh, flat, kind of two-sided paintings. That's why I showed David Smith. Yes, I can hear you. Oh, no, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. What is the favorite? That's a great question. What is my favorite thing I do ex other than painting? Except, except that answer. Uh, what is your, your favorite hobby or I like to read noir novels. I am into David Goodis, a great Philadelphia noir novelist recently. I can't believe him. He's like great. <laughs> and uh, I mean, he's so extreme. And he, the, he takes the characters to such extreme places, but it's totally like, yeah, yeah, he had to get his face completely changed overnight. <laughs> Definitely had to do that. So it's not like science fiction or anything. It's like real. And that is like life. <laughs> so I really, that's what I do. I read. I have stacks of books. Right now I'm reading on the history of Stalin and his five-year plans. So I just, I just read anything. Yes, it does. Somebody like David Goodis really helps me. Really helps me because he's such, he really is so imaginative and so uh, he wrote, you know, he was a pulp novelist. So he wrote thousands and thousands of words and he just kept going relentlessly and creatively, you know? And he wasn't all that famous when he, he did, he inspired Truffaut's movie Shoot the Piano Player. But he wasn't that famous or anything when he was alive. He was a pulp novelist. And now he's recognized, you know, as one of the great noir novelists. But what I'm inspired by is he just keeps going. Persistence, you know? Thank you, Donna. Uh, I remember 1980 as the height of the backlash against women as opposed to the height of the feminist movement. Uh, but I appreciated your comments, and the majority of art students are women. Are you still, do you still think of the history of art and painting as male? Very interesting phenomena, this, that the majority of art students are women. And I don't think it's talked about nearly enough. Not nearly enough. And how it's not a piece of cake. You cannot take on this history. There are all kinds of barriers. 
out there in the world, in the commercial world, unbelievable barriers. Um, and I, I mean, I don't even want to use the word sexism because it's way too mild. It's way too mild. It's like, whoa, it's whoa. It really is. This is painting. And it shows you, no matter how much people put down painting and talk about this and that other form, painting is still the thing. And that's the reason, you know, uh, it, it, and it has huge implications that there's all these women in my classes. And I see, you know, I point this out sometimes to my fellow faculty members, you know. When I was at the Whitney program, I was the only woman, I'll say, and now I have a class that's 100% women, and I see this hostility bloom, and I'm like, I don't know what to do with it, and it's like very, nobody knows what to do with it. It's major. It's major. And then I, I don't know if the earth is still going to be around. We have studios and are able to paint, but in like 200 years, I don't know what kind of impact women are going to have on the history of painting. It's really interesting. But it's not pointed out enough to them of what a big deal it is. Definitely not. Because you don't want to just keep mentioning uh, Lee Krasner over and over again. That's ridiculous. You know, you want them to feel like they can use the history of painting. <laughs> so ha have you, uh, has your opinion about George O'Keefe changed? I still am not a big fan. I, I, I love Emily Carr. And I don't know if you know her, but Emily Carr, you know, is to me a much stronger painter than Georgia. Georgia's, you know, Stieglitz got a hold of her. With the, uh, with the you know, her work changed so much from when she was young. And uh, so, but there's a lot of, I'm discovering, you know, I discover women all the time, interesting women painters, and uh, I, I'm a big fan of Merritt Oppenheim's late paintings, Sea Surface Full of Clouds, and those paintings of surrealist, uh, very interesting collage type paintings, and, uh, you know, I discover, you know, uh, Jay DeFeo, such an interesting artist, but you, you know, uh, unfortunately, when you talk about women, you always have this kind of baggage about, supposedly, about their lives, which is a function of sexism. So you'll hear, well, well, Jay, you know, she used all that lead in, in the rose, and she lost all her teeth, and, and it just makes me furious, because you do not hear that. Men, a lot of male artists have had very rough lives, too, because it's very hard to be an artist, and this society particularly, you know, because it's just very hard. And so it's a tough life. It's a, it's a tough life for everybody. But you always hear about women. Oh, they had this, you know, da blah, blah. And that's a way of discounting their work. That's just a, a total way of discounting their work. And it makes me so mad, and I always speak up about it. You know, I always do. Because we don't talk about, uh, you know, well, it's kind of the way, the way they used to talk about Van Gogh when I was a kid. You know, when I was an uh, undergraduate at Ohio State, Van Gogh was considered a calendar artist, a pathetic calendar artist. So t t times change. Uh, Picasso, late Picasso, was considered pure kitsch when in the 60s. He was. So times change. So I don't worry about it. But I do speak up to my students about it. I do try to talk to them about it, because it's rough. Hello. Um, you, you were mentioning earlier in your talk about um, the arrangements of studios and even studio rules that um, you abide by, like no telephones, no music, all that sort. Is there any sort of grand rule that you set for yourself um, in studio practice that you would say particularly defines your work? That what? Affects that my work? Per particularly defines it, I guess. Defines it? Or helps define it. Get a lot of paintings going at once. By a lot, I mean three or four. I need to get three or four going at once. And that way, and then really get into it and go out there every day, no matter how I feel, you know, and get going, get going. And if I work outside, it's good because, you know, I'm like, a lot of, it puts me under pressure a little bit because the weather changes. And, you know, my painting is wet and I can't really take it inside. And, you know, I want it to dry before I put it up vertically, so it puts me under pressure. 
I always look for things that put me under pressure a little bit, you know. Okay, thanks a lot.